our whole being and why even as a Christian, I can still struggle with sin habits. And one of the things, I know this is not necessarily all in the material, but one of the things that I have noticed through the years is I've spent time with women <laughs> uh, who are struggling with a sin habit they make it all about, okay, I need to change that habit. I need to stop that habit. And and they're going straight to kind of the bottom of the list of things that we need to do in order to change. And, and they can, through their own uh, willpower, so to speak, maybe, you know, stop doing something or start doing something. But it only lasts for a short time because the steps that were necessary before that weren't done. And so that's one of the things that I love about this. And it all starts with 1 Thessalonians 5.23. So I'll put that up here. It simply says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is one of the verses, and there, there is argument in the, the biblical world are we a dichotomy or a trichotomy? Well, I think we're tri, and I think this is why. We have three parts. We are body, soul, and spirit. So, I'm going to try to draw a diagram to show how all three of these come together and how we work. So, I'm going to draw a circle, and I'm really bad at drawing circles on marker boards. And I am going to leave an opening at the top of the bottom. It looks more like a pumpkin, doesn't it? <laughs> and, and I'll explain that here in just a little bit. But, of course, God is the one who created us. And he gave us a body. And that's what this circle represents. And the outer part of that circle is our physical body. And we know why we have a body. I mean, that way you look at Sandy and you know that's Sandy. You can look at me. You know this is me through my physical body and my five senses of no, I'm not going to write them out. Sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. I can participate in the world around me. I mean, that's why we have a body. It gives me that identity and ability to do those things. And so, since the outer part of the circle is the body, I'm going to write these words here. I probably should have already done that. But Scripture also says that we are a soul. And it's not just that we have one. We are one. This is the part of us that lives forever. And so we're going to live forever in heaven or forever in the other place. The soul is who we are on the inside. It's the part of us that thinks and feels and makes decisions. And therefore, our soul is made up of our mind, our emotions, and our will. And I've got them positioned this way for a reason. Now, the Bible also says that we are spirit. And that is the part of us that is able to be aware of ourselves and to fellowship and communicate with God. Now, when God created us, he said it was very good. And we lived in the Garden of Eden and everything was wonderful until one day another spiritual being entered in and he messed everything up. And we all know who that was. Now, it is not a typo in any of my materials. I do not, it's a silly thing. I just don't capitalize his name, not even at the beginning of a sentence. So that's just the thing with me. But Satan came into the Garden of Eden, and we know the story. I mean, he tempted Adam and Eve to, to disobey God, and unfortunately, they gave in to that. And when they gave in to that temptation, Scripture explains to us that another part of the human personality took up residence, and that is the flesh. Now, sometimes in Scripture, you, you just have to read in context. Sometimes when it says flesh, it means, you know, this. But most of the time when it says flesh, it's talking about our sin nature. And that's the part of us that puts ourselves first. And we make decisions based on what we want. And it's, that, it's, it's, it's listening to him and doing what he wants and disobeying God. So, now I've not written flesh on our diagram because there's something else that we need to understand before I, I fill in those parts. There's two doors. And the top door is the one we're gonna call the door of the spirit. And notice the itty bitty doorknob that's on the inside. This 
is the door of the flesh, and likewise that doorknob is on the inside. The will is smack dab in the middle because it is our decision what are the conditions of these doors, open or closed. Now, here's what's, I mean, and, and this is all boom, boom. It all happened at one time. I have to say it in steps, but it all happened in one time. When Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, the great big I, like the human ego, took up residence down the very center of man's personality. The door of the spirit was closed. You see, I can cheat because I've got a marker board here. So that door was slammed shut. The spirit of man died and the flesh took up residence within us. This is what the Bible calls the natural man. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, in fact, let me write that out. Natural man says, A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. See, guys, this is something that a lot of people don't understand, even in church. When we're thinking about our unchurched friends, the Bible says those without Christ are what? Spiritually dead. dead. That's what this drawing helps us to understand. Every person born since Adam, this is how they come into the world. Now, God doesn't hold them accountable for this and the open door of, of the flesh until they're old enough to understand good and bad. Now, a two-year-old can disobey, but that they're, they're just figuring out the world. They don't under, I mean, they know they're disobeying, but they under they don't understand that they're choosing between good and and bad, right or wrong. I mean, Lily can be a little defiant at moments, but she doesn't understand that there's there's morality here. But once a person is old enough, that's when God holds them accountable. Now, the Bible is very clear that doing all the good works in the world does not open the door of the spirit, nor does it resurrect our human spirit and bring to us the spirit of God. We know that Jesus came, lived a life of perfection, died on the cross. And in order for us to have a relationship with God and for this door to be open, we have to receive that gift of salvation. We pray, we repent, and we ask God to take up residence within us. Now, again, I get to cheat because I'm on, using a marker board. And here's what's so cool. Guess what on all of this changes when we, through an act of our will, this is huge, and this is anti-reform theology, by the way. When, through an act of the will, I choose to receive Jesus, what happens, do you think? The door, the door is opened. Big door, no, I'm sorry. What else happens? Our spirit, spirit is, is living in us. Our spirit is actually resurrected. And then the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. And so this would be a regenerated person, but that's just the beginning of the story. And we all know and understand that. Once you come to Christ, it doesn't stop there. Because if it does stop here, then this becomes what the Bible calls a carnal Christian. We've got a struggle going on here. Because the door of the flesh is still open, this person is open to the influence from the enemy. So the enemy can feed his mind with thoughts, which are then going to impact his emotions. And because his will is weak, he's going to make decisions and act and say and do things that are obviously detrimental both to him and to others and contrary to what God would have him do. And so we've got to ask ourselves, okay, I've come to Christ but now what do I do in order to live that victorious life? So we're going to change our diagram and start talking about what does it take to become a victorious Christian. I believe you guys had to learn Galatians 2.20 for this week, didn't you? Yes. I, <laughs> the great big I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in this instance, the physical body, I live by faith in the one who loved me and died for me. Is that right? 
I think I ended it wrong. That loved me and gave me self. Gave himself up for me. That's right. <laughs> so I'm going to change our diagram. Because if I have died with Christ, then the great big focus on me, which this even goes back to the disciples' cross, all of that changes. I'm going to put the cross of Christ at the center of our personality. And then we're going to talk about what we need to do with each portion of what makes us us in order to that, live that victorious life. So based on Galatians 2.20, the mm -hmm. first step is to crucify the flesh. And I'm even going to write the word crucified right across here because it's dead and the itty bitty little Galatians 2.20 here. I need to remind myself that my sin, any sin, has no hold over me. It, it doesn't. I mean, Christ died to break the hold of sin and death on our lives. And so a sin habit, no matter how long it's been a part of my life, Christ has more power than that sin habit. And I've got to recognize that, that, that this is just dead. And so... My flesh is crucified. But the second thing I need to do, because this door is still flapping wide open, <laughs> through an act of the will, I need to close the door of the flesh. So I'm going to shut this door. Because Philippians 2.13 tells me it's God who is at work in me, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, I want, I want you to see what I'm doing here. This is the problem. So we're going to start down here where he has access and work our way up. And then we're going to go from right to left. Like we, I mean, that's how I remember it. I mean, there's no great theological explanation for that. That's just how I remember it. Crucify the flesh. Through an act of the will, close the door of the front flesh. But then I've got to pray. And you'll like this memory verse. It just quite simply says, be filled with the Spirit. Okay? So number three is be filled with the Spirit. Now, what do we need to do with our minds? And we all know this. I mean, that's why we're doing, that's why you guys are doing Disciple Life. That's why we spend time in the Word every day. We need to renew our minds. And the only way we can do that is according to God's Word. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So step number four is... I going to say change your thoughts, but I think I use the word change elsewhere. But uh, let's just do this. Renew your mind so that I'm thinking God thoughts instead of ones that are harmful and hurtful to me. Now, any psychologist, Christian or non, will tell you it is what we think that impacts our emotions. And out of our emotions, we choose to do things <laughs> with our bodies, whether it's our mouth or, or the actual things that we do. So if my thoughts are changing, what is automatically going to happen with my emotions? Well, hopefully those two are changing. And over time, we want them to, to display the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And I could ask Lisa to sing a song because um, I'm sure she knows one. I did. <laughs> but the I said I have one for Galatians 2.20 and for, yeah. Do you really? Yeah. Okay. Would you please sing them and record them? <laughs> it would be good. Yeah. I'm not kidding. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm not musical. That doesn't help me. But Galatians 5.22 and 23 simply says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, love joy, peace, peace, patience, patience kindness, goodness, 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 faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, gentleness self-control. <laughs> Against such things there is no law. So, I'm, I'm just going to go straight to that word. Change your emotions. And then finally, we get down to what we're really after. If my thoughts are changing, which is in turn changing my emotions, how is that going to affect what I say and do? 
I'm waiting for an answer. It's going to be Christ-like. It will. It's going to change. And so I'm also going to alter my well, behavior. Now, I know the diagram has one um, verse on there, but I prefer 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20. It says, and I can almost hear Paul, do you not know, <laughs> kind of out of frustration, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You, you've been bought, for, been bought with a price. You are not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And I think I got phrases mixed up there. You recording me is making me nervous. But anyway, so here we go. This, this is the steps to the victorious life. Too many people want to go straight to this. Okay, I'm going to change what I say or what I do. Mm -hmm. And they, which is, that's great. But unless they are crucifying the flesh and closing that door of influence from the enemy, nothing's going to happen. And at least not long term. And I have to be filled with the Holy Spirit each day, one day at a time. And by golly, I need to be in the Word every day so that my thoughts are changing. Well, if my thoughts are changing, so will my emotions. And if my emotions changing, what I say and do will likewise change. Ta-da!